Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Author Emily Franklin will discuss her brand new novel, The Lioness of Boston, in conversation with author Don Tripp in this Zoom webinar. The Lioness of Boston is a deeply evocative novel of the life of Isabella Stewart Gardner, a daring visionary who created an, um, uh, a legacy in American art and transformed the city of Boston itself. Uh, first, let me introduce tonight's conversation partner, Don Tripp. Uh, Don Tripp's fourth novel, Georgia, was a national bestseller, a finalist for the New England Book Award, and the winner of the Mary Lynn Cotts Award for Art and Literature. Uh, she is the author of three previous novels, including Game of Secrets, Moontide, and The Season of Open Water, which won the Massachusetts Book Award for Fiction. Uh, her poetry and essays have appeared in the Virginia Quarterly Review, AGNI, Conjunctions, and NPR, among others. She graduated from Harvard and lives in Massachusetts with her family, and she is currently at work on her fifth novel. Ooh, can't wait to read it. And a little bit about Emily. Uh, Emily Franklin is the author of more than 20 novels, as well as a poetry collection uh, entitled Tell Me How You Got Here. Her award-winning work has appeared in the New York Times, the Boston Globe, uh, JAMA, and numerous literary magazines, as well as featured and read aloud on NPR and named notable by the Massachusetts, Ma the Association of Jewish Libraries. A lifelong visitor to the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, she lives outside of Boston with her family, including two dogs that are large enough to be lions. Uh, so all uh, nearly 400 of us who are watching live on Zoom, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Emily and Dawn for joining us here tonight. And Dawn, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Robert, thank you so much for that um, fantastic introduction to this program tonight and to, um, to, to us um, and to everyone who's here tonight joining us on Zoom um, and from libraries all over Massachusetts and, and I understand outside of state as well. I just wanna welcome you and thank you so much for, for joining us here tonight. I'm thrilled to be here in conversation with Emily Franklin about her astonishing new novel, The Lioness of Boston. This is an absolutely stunning book. It's a daring story about a remarkable woman, her passion for art, adventure, and ideas. She was an extraordinary visionary who was determined to forge a life on her own terms. I love this book. It's a masterful work, Emily, and I'd love to dive right in and ask a few questions. Absolutely. I just want to thank, thank everybody for coming out tonight. It's really wonderful to have so much support and interest for this novel that took a long time to write. So I'm very grateful. So thank you. So where did this book start for you? I mean, for, you know, I feel like books often start in a lot of different places, but there's usually one moment where um, a story comes alive in a way that allows it to um, live in us for long enough to, um, you know, to transmute the that kind of raw idea onto the page. Where did this book start? What was the inspiration? Sure. So it's actually a multi-part start. And so the first start is when I'm a very young girl and I used to go to the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museums often with my father. Um, and the first thing that I, that I remember being captivated by was the courtyard. And it just seemed magical to me. I had never been inside and outside at the same time. And so that was very special to me. And I remember at the time also as a child being shown around the museum and being taken in by the idea that anything could be art. So this was a place where it wasn't only paintings and sculptures, there were spoons, there were chairs, there was a lock of Robert Browning's hair. There's so much there that is all considered art. So that stayed with me. And then in March of 1990, I was a senior in high school and we took an art history field trip and I sat in the Dutch room and I wrote a paper about storm in the Sea of Galilee. And 10 days later, that painting was cut from its frame in one of the largest art heists in history that we know about. And so what really stuck with me was um, having been so close to this beautiful, important piece of art, 
and now um, being haunted by this empty frame that would be there forever and having the frame stay to sort of show the damage that was done. So I was very curious about um, the place and about the woman. And then several years ago, I was researching a different novel, a sort of medical thriller set also in Boston that had some scenes at the gardener. So I went back and I rekindled my fascination with this place and with this woman. And I thought, you know, she was this incredible, quirky, ahead of her time, strong individual with so much to share with the world and left this lasting piece of art that is her house and a museum for us all. Somebody should write a novel about her. It's so good, such a great story. Oh wait, I write novels, I could do that. <laughs> And so that is really the, that is the story of how this novel came to That's be. That's where it started. And so this novel is, it's so well researched, um, but you weave those historical details into the story in such deft and seamless ways. And, and I feel like when I, um, and I've read this book twice now, um, I read an earlier incarnation of it. And then um, I just read it again when it, when it came out and, and both times I felt like when I, when I, as I entered the novel, I was entering a world, you know, a very precise point in history and a very, you know, a, you know, a really extraordinary, um, this kind of this range of a woman's life over the long throw of time. And what kind of research did you do? And more generally, how do you balance research with writing in your creative process? Um, well, as you suggest, this is a very thoroughly researched novel. Um, and for me, the research always starts with reading books. Um, so I read the letters that Isabella Stewart Gardner exchanged with Henry James, who was a good friend of hers, um, and the letters she exchanged with Bernard Berenson, who starts off as a you know Harvard student, um, this a Jewish immigrant Harvard student that she had, she sponsored, and then uh, he became her art dealer and her art scout, and they forged a very long um, relationship, friendship over the years. Um, so I start with reading, and then I'm taking notes on everything. I'm, I'm reading Frederick Douglass again, um, because I need to know, even if Isabella Stewart Gardner isn't interacting with Frederick Douglass, I need to know if he's talking in New Bedford at that point, because we're close enough to New Bedford. There are scenes in the in the novel that are set in New Bedford. So um, I tend to do research in a in a sort of 360 way. So um, I'm reading about the art and politics at the time, and then everything I can get my hands on about Isabella. And then of course the museum has incredible resources. So if I wanted to look up an object um, that I might reference in the book. Um, or I needed to find something that I wanted to have her collect on a first trip to Europe, for example, I can look in the database at the museum and find out and find an, um, an object that doesn't have a known provenance so that it's a great chance for me to make something up. So how did she get to know this object? Where did she get it? Who gave it to her? I can make all of that up. And so um, in terms of that balancing the writing and the research, um, I was a nerdy sort of academic kid, so research comes pretty naturally to me, and I find everything very interesting, so I always want to know, um, if I'm talking about pine tar, I want to know how to make pine tar, and when was it invented, and I think I find things um, so interesting, I have to be careful not to put too much stuff in there, so um, for me, I have to know when the research stops and when the writing begins. And that for me is usually when the characters begin to talk to me and I begin to hear how I'm gonna figure out whose voice is which. And for Isabella's voice um, came first, um, obviously. And that was when I knew it was time to put the research tools away and begin. And are you able to hold that research, those details in your head? Or is that something that you also, you know, towards the end, like after you've written a draft or maybe like, midway through a draft, do you find that you also are kind of sealing off to do more research, to layer in those, those bits? It just felt so integrated. And yes. It just um, felt so, so deeply alive in that past. So it wasn't even that I was reading about something that happened back there. It felt, it felt viscerally alive to me now. Well, thank you. I mean, that was the goal really. Um, but no, I think when I research, I tend to layer in and layer in and layer in. So it is already sort of arriving fully formed by the time I come to write. And I know if I'm finding um, a, a 
painting technique that I want to mention that that's what John Singer Sargent did when he did her portrait that um, he painted wet on wet. And so I know that I wanna put that in the scene. I, I am literally sticking a piece of paper into my other pieces of paper to layer that scene within that scene, so. So I'd love you to read a short section um, that way, you know, the audience can get a, you know, can get a sense of the voice of the book. And then we'll come back um, to, you know, a few more questions in our conversation. Absolutely. So for anybody who just heard Don say that I was going to read, don't have a panic. This is about two minutes. I'm not going to read the entirety of this very lengthy novel. Um, so to set this up, the novel is structured in four distinct books that um, follow the chronology of Isabella Stewart Gardner's life. Now, the prologue is the older Isabella looking back on her life, and that older voice comes through woven in between each of these books that I just mentioned. But I'm not going to read the prologue. I'm going to start um, when Isabella has just come to Boston. She's about 20 years old. She's newly married to Jack Gardner. And she is um, not being warmly received in the Boston society. And so this um, very short section I'm going to read is um, when she is about to go to a, she's going to a dinner party that she's dreading. Evenings collected Putnam's and Elliot's, Amory's, Cabot's, Lowell's, Warren's, Hallowell's, Weld's, and others. Families Oliver Wendell Holmes summed up as Brahmins in his recent novel, as though they were all interchangeable, elite without uniqueness. I felt a growing despair with this. I wanted the belonging and yet loathed the neediness that ensnared me. The idea that to be integral meant being one of them and by definition, thus not myself, even if I wasn't yet quite sure of who that was. One of the rules for dinner parties, none of the diners ought to feel superior to the others, and yet I felt myself on the lowest rung. We entered the drawing room on the heels of Miss Appleton, whose complexion glowed rosy atop her pale champagne dress, ringlets bobbing and dancing in the light like a sea creature, beautiful and deadly. Mrs. Amory, in green silk pierced through with tidy navy ribbon, embraced Miss Appleton warmly. We waited around a moment so as not to intrude, which was fine for Jack. Men may stand and look around the room and are assumed to be thinking, perhaps measuring the room's dimensions. But women, women often stand and feel foolish as though we are lost, or in my view, as though we are somehow always in the wrong place. I wore a dress that had arrived the day before, sent from Dussour in Paris, where I had first visited with my parents and Jack's sister, Julia, back when we were still in school. I saw Miss Appleton take in the yardage of my outfit, nipped in the waist too much for Boston, lined with buttons on either side. I had thought the sketches from Paris were glorious, different, and only now realized difference ought never be the goal. Miss Appleton's eyes wandered over my dress as she held her stunning face statue still. How unusual. Beautiful people can afford a touch of cruelty. Other guests arrived, comfortable in the house as regulars in the dinner party rotation. The room was grand in the understated Boston way. Upholstered fine furniture, lighting neither too bright nor too dim, nothing too showy nothing that appeared recently acquired, for part of the custom in this realm was to present the self and one's house as always having been this way. I was the only new addition. I love that. Um, and that really captures the way Isabella is an outsider and that sense of being outside, that sense of being exile. It's so hard for her at times. It's it's devastating, it's crushing. At the same time, it galvanizes her sense of individuality, her ferocity, her determination and her will. And I would love you to talk more about that and that dimension of her character, both the outsider and how it, um, how it shapes her vision. Right. So Isabella Stewart Gardner was an outsider. She was born into privilege. She was born into money and she married into money. And I think the assumption from every side was that she would be warmly welcomed into Boston society, but she wasn't. She was an outsider from New York. 
But I think more than that, what what hurt her was her outspoken nature, which of course, you know, hurt her in the beginning um, when the sort of rejection hold, you know, held power over her. But the more um, rejection she dealt with, the stronger she became in many ways. And in fact, being a misfit, which is what she was, ended up being a driving force for her. And as she began to explore her life's purpose, she became friends with other misfits. So she not only collected objects and art, she collected people. And she collected people who perhaps existed on society's outskirts. And so um, today, I think she might have been called an early ally, but she was really um, a bohemian and an interesting, you know, ahead of her time person who happened to be born in a more stifled society. So at the beginning, she was pushing at the edges and pushing at all of the boundaries, but eventually she decided to make her own boundaries, um, which is how she, you know, built this museum in what was a swampland. Right. So one of the things that you also captured in that reading was, um, you know, that formidable intelligence and that incisive wit. Um, you know, I, I, the line was, I think, beautiful people can afford a touch of, of cruelty. And, and I, I love that, um, that edge in her. And I also love, um, and this is so hard to do, creating a character. I also love how, you know, woven through that and, and woven throughout the novel are moments of, um, of incredible heartbreak and vulnerability, um, loss, grace. And, and I'm just so curious about still, you know, after having read the book twice and, um, you know, just I'm so curious about this woman and, and how you created her and, and that sense of kind of that, that reach, you know, that, that kind of reach of a, of a spirit, you know, you capture her capacity for love, her hunger for freedom, you know, her faith in travel and ideas and in art. And the voice of the novel is intimate. Like it was interesting to me what you said earlier about how, you know, of course, Isabella's voice came first, um, you know, and it's the voice that the novel's told through. Um, but what was that process of, of knowing that, that you had arrived at that, at that voice? Well, what was really interesting was the first voice that came to me was the the prologue. The first lines of the novel are the first lines that I wrote, and I always knew that the novel would start that way. Um, I didn't know the novel structure at that point. I wrote the prologue before I really understood how I was going to structure the book, um, but I knew that the older Isabella had to have all of the selves contained within her, right? We're all all of ourselves that we've always been. So we've got our childhood self and our teenage self and our early 20s self and all of those selves. But I wanted Isabella to really be aware of the selves that she had been. And that is um, sort of what ended up suggesting the structure to me. Um, but this wise woman who is super quirky <laughs> still, um, was really the the voice that came first and then what was interesting for me for writing is I then had to dial back and have her be less sure as she was still outspoken right. but she was not wise and she um didn't have her place in society and didn't have her life's passion she was she didn't have her footing and so she had to have a little bit of um quiet desperation where she really wants to find friends and she doesn't know who those friends are going to be and so the beginning of the novel when she is the young the younger voice that i was reading um was really a switch from the prologue voice um and so that was actually um that was trickier for me to navigate at the beginning and then it then it then it came out and then it hooked in yeah and it's it's actually the juxtaposition as a reader is is thrilling and i i love that older isabella's voice and but i also love that um you know the way we move back into and and the book is structured in these you know these four parts of Belle, Mrs. Jack, Isabella, Isabella Stewart Gardner, and this this kind of evolution of identity and this fluidity and multiplicity of selves. You know, artist, wife, mother, you know, girl, lover, sister, friend, and a woman whose you know hunger for life doesn't quite fit in the corners of the world that she's been born into. And you do that so artfully. Um, and so compelling that it's a, it's a, you know, it's a very formal structure, 
um, in terms of that that division, but it just reads, it just, you know, it reads like a dream. Um, so I, I would love, you have chosen a second reading. And again, I would just love to have you share a little bit more of the book um, before we, we go into a few more questions and then take questions from the audience. Absolutely. Um, so I didn't want to, I don't want to give any spoilers away. Obviously the big, biggest spoiler is that she ends up opening a museum. <laughs> But there are spoilers for people who might not be as familiar with a certain certain details from her life. So um, all I will say is the part that I'm going to read now, it's it's further along than the earlier section. Some things have happened. Not all of those things are good. In fact, Isabella has suffered quite a bit and she is trying to move forward with her life, but she is searching for who she really is going to become and what her meaning and her life's purpose is. Autumn that year was a reliable mixture of bright, colorful days that made me feel open and alive, and other days where dark lurked at the edges and leaves skittled like street rats near my boots. I journeyed to Cambridge and let the carriage drop me near Harvard Yard. I paused, knowing I was not allowed in. I imagined stepping inside, listening to academics talk, and I wondered if I might have anything to add. I considered going in, then figured it would be mere minutes before I would be escorted out. I wished I had the nerve, sighed, and then walked on. I made my way along the river, recalling my letter to Ted Lyman, that's a Harvard Museum of Natural History scientist who she has uh, had a few scenes with before. Ted Lyman, who had made good on his offer to introduce me to his cousin, Mr. Charles Elliot Norton, now a professor at Harvard. Mr. Norton appeared to be a man gifted with great intellect and great family name. I thought about Mr. Norton's translations of great works, imagined the texts side by side, how striking the patterns of words must appear, and kept a steady pace until I arrived at Mr. Norton's house. A small, tasteful placard read, Shady Hill. In front of me, the off-season lawn spread itself over a large expanse. There stood in the center a graceful but solid house that seemed so suited to the grounds that it might have sprung up through the earth one past spring. To the sides were outbuildings, a stable, a large glass house partly covered in vines that needed tending, a small pond over which smiled a wooden walking bridge. Mr. Norton appeared as I was ogling both the sign and the trees surrounding the area. What a wonderful spot, I said, a country house in the city. He followed my gaze, taking in the grounds through my eyes as we shook hands. I was born here, he said. I'll die here too. He opened the door for me to come inside. One ought to be able to choose, at least in ideal circumstances, don't you think? I had not ever considered such a thing. While part of me was caught off guard, there was another part of me that had suspected a world like this existed. A world in which I might be asked questions at the start, that I might gaze upon familiar views in such a way that their owners wanted to see how and what I saw. I simply cannot answer you right away, I said, as I removed my hat and shawl. However, if you were to give me more information, I'm quite sure I would form my own opinion on such matters as choosing where or how to die, I said, and could not help but laugh. What an introductory conversation. Mr. Norton returned the laughter. Ah, yes, hello, good to meet you. How do you want to die? We sat in front of a marble fireplace as large as a barn door, the flames already lapping the split wood, a metal grate separating us from the heat. A thoughtful arrangement of tea with both lemon and cream, sugar instead of honey, and a tiered platter of sandwiches, marmalade biscuits, and curves of candied orange rind, such a delicacy, were set in front of us. Before I could comment, an imposing figure in fawn-colored trousers and a black coat appeared. The heavily bearded man inside them strode into the room, plucked a candied orange peel, and held it like a cigar before turning to greet us. Here, he said, and held out a book to Mr. Norton. I ought to have wrapped it now that snow's coming, but I did not. Mr. Norton received the book, turned it over in his hands, and then surprisingly passed it to me. Awkward, I set down my teacup as well as the biscuit I had just taken a bite of. The book was emerald colored, decorated in gilt, the pages beveled. It's lovely, I said, looking up at the man's enormous cloud of beard. Mr. Norton nodded. Mr. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, please meet Mrs. Jack Gardner. We shook hands, which led to the transferal of candied peel stickiness, which in turn made me gesture to the book with my chin so that I wouldn't ruin it. Neither man understood my gesture and the book remained on my lap. 
Mr. Longfellow blocked part of the fire as he, as he addressed us. They're binding copies of our translation in red as well as green. Which do you think? Mr. Norton sipped his tea and said nothing. I had no idea if this was an act of their friendship, thoughtful pauses, or if I was meant to comment. I made a decision. I would have both, I told him. Surely if there are two bindings, one must have both on the shelf. Mr. Longfellow regarded me as one might a tropical bird wandering into a cityscape. I'm quite positive your view is correct, he said, and plucked another candied orange rind, nodded to Mr. Norton, and took his leave of the room without asking for the book back. A maid brought me a damp cloth for my fingers, after which I studied the binding. The Divine Tragedy, I read aloud as I traced Longfellow's name on the cover. The interior pages listed James R. Osgood and Company, Boston. I like to think of this being printed here. Mr. Norton rose and recited to me in Italian, in that book which is my memory, on the first page of the chapter that is the day when I first met you appear the words, here begins a new life. I felt the heft of Longfellow's book on my lap and the weight of Norton's words. Might you be interested in coming to some of my lectures, he asked. I certainly would be, I told him, if my presence wouldn't be too shocking. Being with books suits you, he said. He added, would you like a prescription for change? If you happen to have one at hand, then yes. He handed me the book. Here, this seems to belong with you, he said. I accepted the book and his warmth. I had no such luck as my husband or you attending Harvard, I said. I am having to educate myself. And we have the chance to do that with books and um, libraries. Just wanna kind of point that out. Yeah. The, um, you know, this novel is about, you know, it's about many things. It's about a woman. It's about, you know, it's, it's about history and a time in history. It's also about power and it's also about access. And, and, and that line um, really strikes home of, um, you know, that, that she has had to educate, educate herself. And, and she feels the weight of that. She also feels um, the responsibility, the kind of the social responsibility that comes with that, you know, with the kind of opportunities that she has been afforded. And E.L. Doctorow has a quote that I love um, about, about, you know, the difference between, you know, history or biography and fiction. And um, the historian will tell you what happened. The novelist will tell you what it felt like. And I feel like you really capture in this novel how she felt that sense of, um, how she felt that sense of, of an urgency and also responsibility to build something in the world that had meaning and that would endure. And, and I just would love you to talk a little bit about that and what, what that means for us now. Well, I think, you know, the main thing that Isabella Stuart Gardner really wanted to do was to make art accessible to the public. And she did that, um, despite the fact that it was yet one more area in which people thought she was, you know, a little bonkers for doing so. Um, but I think in terms of her educating herself, she's so, you know, she was so fortunate to brush up against, you know, Charles Eliot Norton um, and, and Ted Lyman. But I think it's her, those um, opportunities that were afforded to her are based on one characteristic that I think that she had in spades, which was she was so curious about the world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, curiosity breeds empathy. So, you, you know, if you are curious about someone, um, it's another way of being kind towards them. And so I think her curiosity about books and art and artists and um, people who um, loved whoever they wanted to love and travel and other cultures um, all came from her curiosity. So um, her intellect um, and her her studies were all based on that, that curiosity. Um, and that is something that she tried to pass on to um, her, her whole world that was around her. So. And her curiosity was something, it's interesting because curiosity is something, at least in me, and I don't, I mean, I can't speak for anyone else, but it's something in me that I, 
I always had it as a child. And um, it's not that I lost it kind of when I was, you know, uh, you know, a little bit younger, but I was just busy. And, and now I find as I'm getting older, like that curiosity is something that I actively cultivate because the world is such an engaged and, and um, an incredible place. And you really feel that sense of aliveness um, that she felt and how that shaped her, her vision and, and her commitment to, to building the museum and to collecting the art. So I'd love you um, to talk a little bit more, if you don't mind, about how you blended fact and, and fiction. Right. Um, it's tricky because obviously this is not a biography. This is a novel. This is fiction. And I have the skill set to write a, a biography. I guess I could, but it's, it's not something that I would ever try to do because I would inevitably want to make people do things on the page that they may or may not have done in real life. Um, so how I approached this was obviously with a ton of research and really wanting to honor the facts as I understood them. And at the same time, you know, my lens of Isabella Stewart Gardner is my particular Emily Franklin lens. If you were to write a book about Isabella Stewart Gardner or another author were, um, it would likely be a, such a totally different book with a different um, focal point. And my lens was really that she was uh, a woman who was ahead of her time and she was sort of a, a feminist before feminism. And yet I really wanted to stay true to the 1800s Gilded Age of Boston historical details. So in order to do that, um, my research really started with the elementary school timeline where I was putting in order all of the bits of her life, all of the important points I knew I wanted to have in there. And then I was also layering in what was happening in the world, what was happening in Boston, what was happening in Europe. Um, and then in terms of where I blended that fact and fiction, um, you know, a great example. So I never, I didn't put things in this novel that there's nothing, there's most of it is true. Um, there are examples um, where it's either open to speculation, it may or may not be true, and we, nobody knows, and so I went with best guess. Um, but then there's um, a good example of the blending would be midway through the book, the first Impressionist exhibit takes place in Paris. Um, it takes place at Nadar's studio. He is a photographer, and that is, in fact, where the first Impressionist exhibit took place. And this was before they were even called the Impressionists. They were just a group of anonymous painters. Um, and, showing at, and showing at that um, exhibit were Monet and Manet and Renoir and Degas and Cezanne and um, Bertha Morisot and so many painters that we know so much about. But I am guessing, and maybe there are some art historians on, on this Zoom, but you know, of the many people who are listening, I'm I'm betting that the artist that I mentioned that everybody knows the least about, comparatively speaking, is Berta Moroso. And she was the only woman who showed there. And so the reason why I have Isabella Stewart Gardner attend the first Impressionist exhibit, although she didn't in real life, she was in Paris at the time, but she didn't attend the exhibit, is so that she can overlap with Berta Moroso. Because if Isabella is going to end up being ahead of her time and winds up opening this museum, um, you can arrive at the end of a life and know that you're a fully formed person. But in the pages of the novel, I have to show how she's becoming that person. And so I chose to have her go to this very real exhibit that really unfolded the way that it did. And she was really in Paris and I got to have her interact with Morisot so that Isabella herself could end up questioning her own role in art. What's the role of a woman in society? What's the role of women in art? Um, what's, what is it like to be a female artist? What is, what is it like to champion an artist, even if one is not an artist? Um, and so I really got to explore where those facts and fictional boundaries overlap. And so that's a good example of that. And the so representation I guess what I'm saying is any choice that I made to have something that wasn't factual was in service to Isabella's character and in service to my lens for this novel, which is, um, you know, in poetry, which I also write, as you know, um, and in fiction, I often think that, you know, it's our, our job is to tell the truth, but sometimes the most 
the best way to tell that truth is to make something up, to demonstrate that truth. Well, and I think that the representation of women over, I mean, I found this when I was writing about O'Keefe is that um, our interpretation of her and our, you know, the representation of her in history um, or, it, you know, in the time that she was writing, it was shaped by the, you know, the critical interpretations of her art of that time. Like, so, so that real, and that's what, you know, that's what I wanted to write about. And I wanted to unpack is because that, that dynamic was so complicated for her um, and was documented to be complicated for her and her letters. And, and yet it has shaped our understanding of who she was and what she was after. And one of the things that I think when you're, or at least for me, when I'm writing, uh, you know, historical fiction about, about a woman, um, you know, it does feel that there's an obligation that we have as novelists to capture the spirit of those women in a way that is, that is, as you say, true to their character and true to their spirit and true to their documented vision. And, you know, I feel that that was for me a driving force in, in, in writing my novel. It felt critical to contribute to the scholarship around O'Keefe. And, and I really feel one of the things that I love so much about, about your book, about the Lioness of Boston, is I do feel that it contributes to the scholarship um, around Isabella Stewart Gardner in meaningful, in mean, and her legacy in meaningful ways. Well, that's really kind. Thank you for that. <laughs> So I have one other question before we kind of open up to, to our audience. I would love you to talk a little bit about your relationship with the art that she collected. Is there a piece of art that particularly speaks to you that you would, that you would want to have? It's so hard to choose. I mean, every time I went back to the museum, I would think, Ooh, that would, that's so beautiful or that's so interesting. And all these objects, um, you know, some of them wouldn't even fit in my house. I think they take take up full walls and and everything. But um, there is um, Dodge McKnight has a whole room at the museum. Um, Dodge McKnight um, was friends with Van Gogh. Just so the other thing, Isabella Stewart Gardner was friends with all these very famous people. Now they're famous, Henry James and John Singer Sargent and all these people. And it's so interesting because Dodge McKnight, who became a friend of hers and a very important artist to her, he was also friends with Vincent Van Gogh and everybody was friends with everybody else. And it's so funny to think of everybody being alive at the same time. Um, but in terms of the piece of art that I wish that I could have, um, I guess it's one that sort of flies under the radar a little bit, but um, there is a scene in the novel where I get to talk about it because I, I just love it so much. And it's called The Bay at Belle Isle and it's by Dodge McKnight and it's, um, it's a waterscape. And for anybody who lives near the water or wishes they live near the water or misses the water, it's just a beautiful one to, to look up. And um, yeah, so I guess it would be The Bay at Belle Isle, Dodge McKnight. And uh, one one last one last question before I have other questions too, but I just want to make sure that we leave enough time for any questions that are coming from the audience. Um, how do you feel your work as a poet impacts your process and your voice as a novelist? That is a great question. Um, so one thing, every I have read every sentence of this book aloud at least I don't know five times. Um, so I read everything aloud, and poetry is both about how it is on the page, but how it sounds. And so um, the, the dialogue, I will, I will speak the dialogue and make sure it sounds authentic. And if there's one word or one syllable that's out of place, then I will trim that. And the same thing for the description. I think poetry for me, the way that I write is to explain or describe very complicated feelings or situations in the simplest way possible so that it's the most accessible. And I think that's what I try to do with this too, which is to be able to describe things, I hope beautifully and um, deeply, but also in ways that make this book readable for everybody. This is not meant to be so dense that people can't tear into it the way that you would a favorite book. And I would, I would, I really wanted it to be that for people. Yeah, that's great, thank you. Robert, um, are there any questions that we, um, that Emily can take from the audience 
I'd love you to share any, any questions that might've come in. Absolutely, Dawn. So we have uh, roughly 20 questions already. Um, and uh, a few folks, Emily and Dawn, feel free to chime in at any time. Uh, but Emily, we have a few folks uh, asking questions about your title. How did you choose the title for your book? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so there is a sketch of Isabella Stuart Gardner that exists um, of Isabella walking to lions down Commonwealth Avenue in Boston. No one really knows if she did this, if she didn't do this, but let me tell you, in this novel, she does it because why wouldn't I wanna write about a woman walking lions down uh, the street in Boston. And what I really was looking for in the title was I wanted to ground, you know, to really ground the book in a place, which is Boston. This is a Boston book. So much of how Isabella is becoming herself is runs parallel to Boston becoming the city that we know it to be today. So we get to see the opening of the Swan Boats, the first time the Boston Symphony Orchestra plays, Mass General Hospital, Perkins School for the Blind, all of this stuff is written about. Um, and the building of the Museum of Natural History, which now is a restoration hardware, everybody. You can buy a couch right there. But um, I wanted to have something strong. Lions are very strong and female. So lioness is female. And when I first started going to the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, the entrance was um, in a different place than it is now. And the front was flanked by two stone lions. So... That is how it became the lioness in Boston. Uh, Jennifer asks, what is one of the most interesting or surprising facts you learned about Isabella during your research? Well, I think what was surprising for me, I knew that she had all of these um, famous friends. What I didn't know was how close she had been to her sisters-in-law. And in fact, they were really her first friends um, and how she really learned about friendship. Um, and one of the sister-in-laws, uh, Julia, is how she met her husband, Jack. Um, they had gone to school together in Paris and it was uh, visiting her one time that she met Jack Gardner, who would become her husband, and her other sister-in-law, Harriet, she was very close to. And so that was very surprising to me. Uh, I just in the chat uh, posted a link to the line image that you just referred to. Uh, that was passed along by a attendee. So thank you for that. Thank you. Um, an anonymous attendee asks, if Isabella was here today, what do you think she'd be doing? That is a great question. Um, I don't know what she would be doing. I suspect she would still be collecting because I think she really developed a huge passion for collecting art. She collected art, she collected people. Um, but I suspect that though I, I can't think of what she would be doing aside from collecting, although I think she'd be educating and opening up, she'd probably have collected enough to open another place and she would open that to the public too. Um, I, I know that she would be really into tweeting and texting and memes and all of the ways that we have to communicate now because she was really witty. She had a lot to say. She had opinions um, and she was not afraid to share them. So I think she, maybe she'd be writing op-eds. Uh, Margaret asks, has the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum uh, had any comments about your book? Um, we were featured in the Boston Globe side by side, my book, The Linus of Boston, next to their biography that came out in the fall. Um, I guess the Globe thought it would be a really interesting book group pick to sort of be able to look at the fictionalized version of a life. Um, but we have not. And um, I wish I wish they they wanted to to do stuff with the book, but I think um, they have they're not that interested yet. Um, I know that the museum is is not carrying the the novel in the bookshop um, or in the gift store. Um, hopefully that'll change, but um, I, they have not had more of a comment than that. Well, we're going to change that, Emily. Let's start start the petition. Uh, Topher asks of the four books of Isabella, her four different personas, which do you think is the truest, and which best represents quote a woman ahead of her time. Oh, um, that is a very complex question. Um, I mean, I think what I was really trying to do with the having the four different books was to um, 
to suggest that she, uh, with this older, wiser voice, that she has all of these other selves within her. So she's always been ahead of her time, but the question is finding out how best to use that voice and which is what she gains by the end of the novel. So I think the final book is, is super important because she figures out what to do with herself and how to be comfortable. And the more she lets go of society's expectations, the more fun she has, the more fun Boston has watching her and um, enjoying the spectacle of Isabella, and the more she's able to do with do good in the world and, and find a way of showcasing art for the, the public. Um, so I suspect that um, all of the books demonstrate that, but then the further we get along in the, the novel, the more fully realized she is as that ahead of her time person. And there's a line in the book that I'm, I'm not going to be able to recall right off, but it's about how there are these different pieces of her heart and her passion and her desire. And, and they're all, and she goes, or like the, it, it's all of that kind of, um, you know, those broken pieces that she's collecting back and, and reassembling into this, into this museum. Um, but you really do feel that she has she has this relationship to all of these people that she collects, these lives that she collects, these stories that she collects, these layers of consciousness that she that she draws together. And then the art and the museum and that indoor outdoor space that you describe, like the whole of it is a representation of just this incredibly complex layered layered woman. Uh, an anonymous attendee wants to know, how long did it take you to write this book? It took me a long time, anonymous attendee. <laughs> <laughs> no, it took a long time to research. Um, it took um, a year of research and then um, about a year and a half to write, but then another half a year to edit. So um, I have a great editor at Godin and um, we were very meticulous with the line edits. And there was obviously a lot of fact checking that goes into it. So um, I think all told it took, took several years. Uh, Marigold says, the way you write is beautiful. Is there a book about the craft that you would suggest to an aspiring writer? Oh, what a great question. And also Marigold, what a name. That's awesome. Um, I think Stephen King on writing is really great. I think Bird by Bird um, and Lamott. Um, and other than that, I just, my, my advice is really just to read widely, um, not just in the genre that you're trying to write in, but in all genres. So um, I've written and published poetry, fiction, nonfiction, young adult, memoir, cookbook, screenplays. Um, and I think um, that's both because that's everything that interests me, but also I think the, the, the broad read provides skills that you, you might not otherwise have. So for instance, reading nonfiction, if you're trying to write a short story, you still will get tools from that. So those are my suggestions. Uh, Jill has a great question. Let me pull Jill's question up. Jill says, as a writer, do you find yourself trying to pattern your style after other similar writers? Or do you, do you have your own sense of self as a writer from the start? Uh, also, do you have a particular writer whom you admire? I admire a lot of writers, so I'll answer that in the reverse. I admire a lot of writers. As I was saying, I read a lot and I read widely in lots of different genres. So I love thrillers and I love historical and I love poetry. Um, I love um, nonfiction and memoir. Um, I don't pattern myself on anybody. And in fact, I never read in the genre that I'm writing in. So for writing historical fiction, I will sort of have a block on historical fiction for a solid period of time, like a, a year before and a year out. You know, I, I don't like to muddy the waters. It's too easy as a writer to be reading something and things sort of trickle in and I don't like to do that. Um, so that's that's what I do to try. And I, and I definitely have a sense of my own writing. Um, you know, I started writing when I was a kid. Um, I first started publishing writing when I was in high school. Um, so I've been doing this for a very long time. Um, 
and uh, so I definitely have my my own voice, but I admire so many so many writers and so many poets. All right, so we'll ask some more questions about Isabella because lots of folks have questions about Isabella. Uh, Rami would like to know who helped Isabella choose the art for her collection. Oh, that's a great question. Um, so the most in important person in that realm was Bernard Berenson. Um, and he became her art scout. As I said before, she, he was um, a Harvard undergrad that she sponsored after he graduated. He wasn't quite sure of his path, but he ends up becoming, you know, one of the foremost voices in Italian Renaissance uh, art and certainly was her primary source for um, scouting and buying art. Um, and so, you know, in the in the Linus of Austin are tons of letters. They're all made up, but some of the letters that you get to see are her acquisition and purchase of artwork that Bernard Berenson is scouting for her. So, for example, um, she's very determined to own um, the Rape of Europa, um, and um, he's trying to help find it and, and bring it towards her and telling her the prices that are going to be acceptable. And there's a great back and forth. And so he was really her art advisor in that realm. But she also had an eye. So she might go to Venice and come back with stone fountains and wine goblets and what seemed to be 14,000 chairs. I don't know when the last time people were at the museum. It's really an extraordinary amount of chairs that she has in there. But she, um, she, she collected things that she liked and things that she was advised to collect. Uh, several questions about her, her house, her mansion. Um, anonymous attendee asks, how did, he, how did she decide to build the house? Why at that location? And why as an, an Italian villa? Oh, great questions. So originally, so in the beginning of the novel, you'll read that um, if you choose to read it, um, Isabella lived at 152 Beacon Street. Um, eventually she um, had too much art to be contained within 152 Beacon Street and actually pushed through to the next house. And pretty soon that amount of art took over that house too. She had the idea of building um, a, a house in Boston that was based on the palazzo, the palace she used to visit in Venice. She fell in love with Venice as a city and everything that it represented to her. And when she would go visit um, this family named the Curtises, um, who had a son whose artwork she ended up collecting, um, she was just completely taken in um, by their courtyard, which is what her courtyard is based on. And so that's the style of house that she wanted to build. And in terms of the location, um, you know, all I can do is speculate, but she wanted it to be different because everything she did was different. And that was really important to her to have uniqueness. And um, that was an expanse of land. The Fens at that time was, you know, a deserted swampy muck land. And everybody really thought she was crazy. And you can actually find online pictures of her in her full length Victorian garb, standing there determined to build this, you know, house behind her. Um, and it's really, it's just a joy to see. She's up on the ladder. She's down trying to arrange tiles. She was very, very involved in the building of this, but that's why she wanted it to look that way. Uh, so folks, we're going to begin to wind down. I'm going to ask just a few more questions. Uh, Jessa would like to know, uh, you mentioned that you had a timeline of Isabella's life. What years are covered in your historical novel? Okay, so we start in um, eight, in 1861, and we end in 1903 when the museum has opened. Uh, you touched on this a little bit with uh, the the conversation with Don, but it, it is a good question, and it comes up comes up uh, quite a quite a bit when we're uh, hosting historical fiction authors. So Barbara asks, when I read your book. Will I be able to discern fact from your carefully crafted fiction? You will not. That is the hope. Um, I think people who are scholars are not are able to do that so much. And that's not so much a pat on my own back as, you know, it was very careful with that. Again, 
so much of it is true. There are some parts that are either pushing at the edges of truth or that are made up. There are characters in here who are not real people who were not real people. Obviously, Henry James really is Henry James. Um, but there are people that I made up because I can't have a novel that's entirely populated by name dropping people. Um, and I don't think you'll be able to tell, but I, I've had a, a, some great reader letters emailed to me um, about people Googling certain things only to find out there's no online trace of this person and it's because I made them up. And so that's very reassuring to me. So hopefully it'll be in the, again, as I was saying, the most truthful way, um, uh, you know, a made up thing is, is um, sometimes the biggest truth of all. So um, I hope that readers will really connect with this strong ahead of her time woman and understand why I made um, any of the fictionalized choices that I did to create what I hope is a gripping novel as well as um, some a novel that people can learn things from. Uh, final question goes to another anonymous attendee. Uh, they write collector is a characterization that has come to take on negative connotations today, such as wasteful, hoarding, uh, even dorky. Uh, Isabella finds power in being a collector. How did you help that empowerment? That is such an interesting question, Anonymous. Um, and it's something that I wrestle with too, which is on the one hand, um, oh, life is short, why do I bother collecting anything? On the other hand, life is short. I should collect things, you know? Um, and the way that I approach it in this book is really what we collect it tells about ourselves. And Isabella's way of collecting, the act of collecting for her was first of all, something that she was um, capable of doing. She had a great eye, she arranged things. The reason why the museum is the way it is. And if anybody moves a single thing, it all goes to Harvard. So nothing can be moved. The reason she did that is she really had a vision. And so that vision was to collect in order to show the collection to the public. So it was not entirely self-serving, which I think is very helpful um, in terms of the um, against hoarding. Um, I think she, um, she wanted to create an environment that felt safe and exciting and very um, interesting to her and to everybody who visited. Um, and as I said, she collected people as well as objects and art. And I think that was um, just part of who she was. She, she made a circle of friends where once she had none and she created a house with tons of artwork where once there was nothing. And so I think um, I choose to see it as um, less hoarding and more um, a beautiful collection of meaningful um, people and, and objects that she wanted to share with the world. So folks, let's give Emily and Dawn a big virtual round of applause for a wonderful presentation tonight. I do want to again thank Emily. I want to thank Dawn. I want to thank the bookstore partner, Book Oasis and Stoneham. I want to thank Emily's team, uh, particular, particularly uh, Celia, uh, Celia Johnson from Godine. And I want to thank the uh, 19 partnering libraries, including Arlington, Ashland, Clinton, Groton, Hopkinton Lowell, Manchester Merrimack, Nashua, Newburyport, North Reading, Rockport, Sharon, Spencer, Vineyard Haven, Wayland, West Newbury, and Westford. So look for an email for me tomorrow with a link to this recording, a link to a feedback survey, a, a link to uh, the Book Oasis in Stoneham to purchase a copy of Emily's book. I'll also include both Emily and Dawn's websites. Uh, so look for that email tomorrow. And I know we didn't rehearse this, but Emily or Dawn, do you have any last words for the audience? I do. I just want to say thank you so much for tuning in and for this support. It means so much to me. I work alone almost all the time. So to be able to share the work with actual humans is really lovely, anonymous or not. And um, if you choose to buy the book, um, I'm just very grateful for that too. It's really important for working artists. So thank you so much. I, I just want to say that um, mother, uh, I bought this book for my mom for Mother's Day. She doesn't know. I, I'm not sure if she's on tonight, but she knows now. <laughs> it, it, um, I, I just I just feel so fortunate to be here, not just because I love this book so much, but also because 
Um, libraries are where, for me, when I was a young um, reader and wanted to grow up to be a writer, I just felt like every time I entered a library, I was just surrounded by, you know, all these spines and behind every spine, there was a world. And so thank, I just wanna thank all of the libraries who've come together tonight to, um, to, to support this event. Well, thank you, Emily, and thank you, Dawn, and thank you for a, a wonderful conversation and a great evening. So thank you all so much, and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their night. Thanks, Robert. Thanks, Dom. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thanks, Robert. Thanks, Emily. Bye.